um, uh, coming along to this uh, uh, Zoom meeting. Um, uh, so first thing I, I should say is um, I promise to keep the, the physics to an absolute minimum, um, sort of light touch. I'm not going to be giving you lots of equations or anything like that. Um, but what I want to do um, is uh, take a particular episode in not just the history of physics, but the history of sort of philosophical reflection on physics and use it to illustrate um, Oh. Uh, okay, here you go. Yep, sorry. <laughs> Use it to illustrate um, a much broader and more, I think, significant theme, um, which we've all become aware of, uh, especially recently, about ha having to do with the way in which history gets rewritten, uh, certain episodes get um, lost or effaced. Um, we see this uh, in the history of art, in the history of philosophy, we see it in the history of physics. And recovering that effaced history um, can reveal um, resources, further resources that we can use in our current philosophical endeavors. Um, and in this case, in particular, um, diverse philosophical traditions. Um, a tradition that in the, uh, in the usual story, and I'll be talking about the usual story in a minute, just isn't mentioned at all. And I think, well, um, as Darius said, I'm working on a, a book project right now on this, and I'm trying to use that uh, philosophical tradition, particularly uh, uh, the phenomenological tradition, to try and uh, shed new light on some sort of classic problems to do with not just uh, physics and, and quantum mechanics, but um, our relationship to the world to get a bit um, grandiose. Okay, so I'm going to begin by um, uh, talking about, uh, this is really the only slide that, re or one of the very few slides that concerns any, any physics. Um, one of the central <coughs> ideas, principles behind um, uh, uh, quantum mechanics is the this idea of superposition okay uh, it's like a fundamental feature of the theory so if you consider a radioactive atom say an atom of uh, uranium 235 whatever according to quantum mechanics at any time the state of the atom has to be described as a superposition of atom not decayed and atom decayed now trying to understand what that means. What does it mean for the state of the atom to be in a superposition? That's kind of like the, one of the most fundamental conceptual problems at the heart of quantum physics. Um, and partly what I'll be uh, you know, edging around today is, is, is that issue. Um, but what quantum mechanics does, um, it gives us the probability of seeing the atom as either not decayed or decayed okay it gives the probability in this case for example the probability of the atom decaying at some time would be say 50 percent and quantum mechanics is one of the most um, empirically successful theories ever um, because it gives these probabilities and you know they come out um, correct they come out uh, you know it makes predictions uh, if you do this, you'll see this 30% of the time, you'll see that 70% of the time, and they come out, they turn out to be true. And it's, it's, it's so effective um, that, in fact, many people regard it now not so much as just a theory, as a kind of, but more as a theoretical framework for a whole bunch of <clears throat> specific theories dealing with certain phenomena. It's like the, the sort of uber framework now for modern physics. Now, the, the person who um, really sort of cemented superposition at the heart of um, quantum mechanics was Schrodinger, Erwin Schrodinger. I'm afraid most of my talk today, in fact, all of my, the, all the characters in my talk today are um, uh, middle-aged white men, I'm afraid, but um, that's just the nature of the history of physics at the time. 
Um, and Schrodinger was having, you know, proposed this proof of superposition. He himself was really perplexed by it. What could it mean? And <clears throat> in an exchange of letters with Einstein, he came up with his famous cat thought experiment <clears throat> as a way of illuminating just how odd this principle is, this superposition principle. So here's Schrodinger's cat thought experiment. And if you're unhappy about putting a cat in a box uh, with some poison, just think of it as Schrodinger in a box with some poison. Although if you do that, it actually changes, as you'll see later on, it actually changes things a little. But the idea is, said Schrodinger, imagine we have a radioactive atom <clears throat> in a box. We put a Geiger counter there. If the Geiger counter is, if the atom decays, the Geiger counter is triggered. Uh, it initiates a hammer to, that breaks a, a bottle of poison and the cat dies. Okay, that's the setup. Now, according to quantum mechanics, on the assumption that the theory applies to all physical entities, both microscopic and macroscopic, so if you assume, and it's a big assumption, and we can come back to this in the discussion, but if you assume that it applies to the atom, the Geiger counter, <clears throat> the hammer, the poison, and the cat, then according to quantum mechanics, on the basis of that assumption, that whole setup has to be described as a superposition. And in particular, the state of the cat in the box has to be described as a superposition of cat alive and cat dead. But we know, don't we, that when we open the box, we either observe a live and perhaps not very happy cat, or sadly, a dead one. That shift from a superposition to a definite result lies at the heart of what's known as the measurement problem in <clears throat> quantum mechanics. And the usual story runs as follows. Given the assumption that quantum mechanics applies to all physical objects, microscopic and macroscopic, the answer to the question, what is responsible for this shift from a superposition of states to a definite state, has to be something non-physical. It has to be consciousness, the consciousness of the observer. <clears throat> you open the box and your consciousness is responsible <clears throat> for that shift, for collapsing the superposition into a definite state. That's the usual story. And for many years, it was taken to be the orthodox view. Now, it doesn't take much philosophical training, really, to sort of start raising your eyebrows at that story. And indeed, <clears throat> in the early 1960s, that orthodox view was really uh, put to the test in uh, a big debate in, um, the, uh, in the literature, uh, both philosophical and uh, physics. Uh, some of these papers were published in the journal Philosophy of Science. On the one hand, you had this guy on the top left of the, of the image, of the, of the slide, Eugene Wigner. Uh, Wigner, um, he's not really a household name, um, certainly not like Einstein or even Heisenberg, but he was one of the greatest physicists of the 20th century, <clears throat> excuse me, responsible for many conceptual innovations, applications of quantum physics. And he was, describes himself in his autobiography as being from a very early age interested in consciousness, the nature of consciousness, the role of consciousness. He read Freud, for example, and so on. Um, and together with his sidekick, bottom left, Henry Margano, not nearly as good a physicist, but he wrote some, at the time, quite influential books in philosophy of science. Together, they defended this view that it's consciousness that's responsible for the shift from the superposition, cat alive cat and cat dead, to the definite state, cat alive or cat dead. Opposing them were two people, one of whom I hope you will know 
or have heard, at least have heard of, that's top right, that's Hilary Putnam. Uh, probably one of the most uh, well-known and uh, respected philosophers of the 20th century, did you know, uh, important work in philosophy of language, philosophy of maths, philosophy of science. At this time, he's just a young whippersnapper, um, eager to make his name in the world, so he takes on these guys. Um, together with the guy <coughs> bottom right, Abner Shimoni, uh, Shimoni is one of those infuriating people who had two PhDs. He got a PhD in philosophy, and then he decided he really needed to learn some physics, so he got a PhD in physics, curiously enough, with Wigner. So this is one of those classic situations where the student turns on the professor. And Putnam and Shimoni basically said, guys, appealing to consciousness to solve the measurement problem just replaces one mystery, the mystery of how we go from a superposition to a definite state with another. The mystery of how does consciousness cause this change? How does consciousness lead to, yield uh, this result? And that was, whoops, that was basically um, the end of the story. Uh, they were taken to have, you know, given, Putnam and Shimoni were taken to have given the consciousness view, the thrashing that many people thought it so richly deserved. By the mid 60s, it was really, as, as, at least philosophically, it was really out of the picture. And the door, as it were, or space was opened up for alternative answers to the question. You know, what's going on with this shift? So, for example, the many worlds interpretation uh, initially proposed by Everett in the, in the mid-50s started to come into prominence. And on the many worlds interpretation, there is no shift <clears throat> because the many worlds interpretation says you have to read the super, a superposition in the following way. The superposition is actually describing or, or encoding all the different possibilities, okay? So that the terms of the superposition, cat alive or cat dev, correspond to different possible worlds. So when you open the box, what's going on is there isn't a shift, there isn't a collapse of the superposition. When you open the box, in one world, there's a you that observes a live cat, and in another world, there's a you that observes a dead one. I'm happy to talk about this interpretation, you know, in the discussion. I know it's one of those that, you know, attracts a lot of interest. Um, it's, you know, been the subject of, you know, many science fiction novels and movies and so on. Um, there's a very nice, uh, um, if quite challenging book by Al Wilson that's just been um, published in which he identifies Everett's many worlds with David Lewis's possible worlds. And he does a nice job of pulling on the resources of Lewisian metaphysics to help support and illuminate uh, the many worlds interpretation, and also using the many worlds interpretation to naturalize uh, Lewis's account. Like I said, I'm happy to, to talk about that in the discussion, but here I just mention it um, as uh, really the, the you know, um, the opportunistic outcome <clears throat> of the end of the consciousness causes collapse view. That's the usual story. That's the history that I was taught. That's the history that for many years I taught my own students in the philosophy of physics. Um, and it's wrong. Okay, it's history that has been, uh, well, appropriated, manipulated, presented in a certain way, in a way that misses out um, what actually was really going on in that, uh, in that debate. And the real story starts here with uh, this guy, Fritz London, who wrote a little, um, it's not, it's bigger than a paper, smaller than a book, it's like a little pamphlet in French, The Theory of Observation in Quantum Mechanics, uh, with this guy, Edmund Bauer. Now, I'm not going to say much about Bauer. Bauer was a good physicist. 
but that's about it. <clears throat> it's all, I feel a bit awkward being so dismissive because he actually was uh, a hero of the French resistance during World War II, um, uh, as were his son and daughter. So there's a lot more to him than what I've just said. But <clears throat> for this story, I want to focus on Fritz London. Uh, and there's a lovely biography by uh, Kostas Gavroglu. Uh, the paint, I've given the, the book image there. The painting is by London's uh, wife, Edith, who was quite a talented painter. And Fritz was, um, again, uh, a great physicist. Um, he was, together with a guy named Heitler, he was responsible for the first quantum explanation of the formation of chemical bonds, um, leading Heitler to exclaim, now we can eat chemistry with a spoon, i.e. all of chemistry can be reduced to physics. Um, together with his brother, Heinz London, he was... He came up with the first model of superconductivity. And many people predicted that he, he would get the Nobel Prize, but he died quite sadly in his early 50s from a heart attack. And they never give out Nobel Prizes posthumously. So he, he didn't actually get the Nobel Prize. But there's more to him than just that. Fritz London had a real genuine interest in philosophy. When he was at high school, the equivalent of high school, the gymnasium in Germany, he wrote essays on Kant and when he went to Munich and he, at Munich he ended up uh, studying physics but he also fell in with a group of philosophers and these were the Munich phenomenologists and in fact London uh, wrote a dissertation on uh, basically in epistemology that was so considered to be so good it was published in the yearbook of phenomenology and he always maintained that all of his scientific work all of his scientific work um, was informed by uh, this phenomenological tradition which I'll come to in a second now why 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 am I mentioning this what's what's the point well at the heart of this debate, both sides, Wigner and Margner on one side, Putnam and Shimoni on the other, appealed to this little book by London and Bauer. Wigner, as I've given in the quote there, describes it as summarizing quite completely what he calls the orthodox view. Putnam and Shimoni criticized it on these lines, on the lines I gave uh, just, uh, uh, just a minute ago, um, that it doesn't explain how the mind somehow reaches out into the box and causes the collapse of the superposition. But both Wigner and Margano and Putnam and Shimoni failed to appreciate that London and Bauer's little book is thoroughly informed by phenomenological philosophy, okay? Um, Shimoni actually uh, acknowledges this in an interview um, many years later and basically said, yeah, actually our criticisms kind of missed the point. Um, okay, phenomenology. So let me, <laughs> this is, um, uh, well, it's, it's, this is kind of impossible to sum up in just a couple of slides, really. Um, so I can't do justice to it. Um, it goes back at least to Husserl, and there I've given a picture of Husserl as a young dude uh, with all the facial hair. Um, Husserl himself changed or shifted his views over the years, um, and recent, over the last 20 years or so, the kind of recent release of much of his unpublished work has uh, really revised a lot of views um, of his uh, philosophy. Um, and in addition, different groups have understood his philosophy in different ways. I mentioned that London, Fritz London, fell in with the Munich phenomenologists. There are also the Göttingen phenomenologists. Um, currently in the United States, there are the East Coast phenomenologists versus the West Coast phenomenologists. And if you've ever seen West Side Story, think Jets versus Sharks. I mean, these are just two rival gangs in phenomenology. I'm going to try and sum it up in sort of, well, not quite 10 words or less, but in, in, in three slides or less. The basic idea behind phenomenology 
is, as Husserl put it, it is the science of the essence of consciousness. Or as uh, David Woodruff Smith puts it in his um, piece in the Stanford Encyclopedia, phenomenology is the study of consciousness. That is, conscious experience of various types as experienced from the first person point of view. So the core idea of phenomenology is <clears throat> to examine conscious experiences of different types, beliefs, judgments, uh, imagination, um, in and of themselves. Okay, just, you know, just, as it were, turn inwards and consider these experiences from your first person point of view. And the defining trait, it is claimed, of conscious experience is intentionality, that these experiences, as it were, point to something. They might point to what we would call a real object, they might point to a hallucination, but they have this intentional aspect. And the, <clears throat> what's sometimes called the phenomenological norm is that in that examination, we should avail ourselves of nothing but what in consciousness is made essentially evident in its pure imminence. This is like, like the bedrock. Think, this, you know, this is the equivalent of Descartes' uh, cogito. I think, therefore, I am. Uh, we should examine, as it were, the essence of our conscious experiences and build on what is essentially evident in its pure imminence, what cannot be denied, what has to be taken as, uh, you know, essential to that experience. And that idea of imminent knowledge, it has a certain crucial significance uh, in this context, as we'll see. But as I said, um, what we find when we look at our experiences is that these experiences have this intentionality. They are about uh, things. And in particular, at least some of them are about the world, or as phenomenologists like to put it, the world as it is for us. Dan Zahavi, Zahavi in his recent book, Husserl's Legacy, expresses this in terms of there being a correlation between consciousness and the world as it is for us. Now, here's where you can go down two different paths, or many different paths, but here's, here's at least two of them. You can take the world as it is for us in a kind of non-realist, constructivist fashion, or you can give it a more realist gloss. What you can't do is adopt a kind of naive representational realism. You can't say that our conscious experiences simply mirror the world as it is. Okay, there's arguments you can give, other phenomenologists, phenomenologists give, that that's just not a viable uh, route to go down. But you can talk about the world as it is for us in the world. And as Beck put it back in 1928, consciousness in the world stand in a correlative, i.e. mutually dependent, context of being. Now, there's a lot to unpack in that notion of context of being. But here, all I want to do is, is focus on <clears throat> the significance here uh, of the relation between subject and object. That's crucial, and it's crucial in the story of uh, Schrodinger's cat. Schrodinger himself, as many other uh, physicists at the time, um, believed that quantum mechanics revealed something important about that relationship between subject and object. But it was London, in this pamphlet with Bauer, who really um, articulated that uh, in, in some detail in what I claim is this phenomenological, in the context of this phenomenological tradition. So they begin their um, pamphlet in, in, in quite a surprising way, I mean, you know, this is this is a, a, a you know, uh, an article in physics. It was they they were expecting physicists to read this, and they begin in the following way. This is from the English translation. Actually, it was Shimoni who who translated uh, the the pamphlet. They say that without intending to set up a theory of knowledge, although they were guided by um, rather questionable. Um, Philosophy, 
Physicists were, so to speak, trapped in spite of themselves into discovering that the formalism of quantum mechanics already implies a well-defined theory of the relationship between the object and the observer, a relation quite different from that implicit in naive realism, which had seemed until then one of the indispensable foundation stones of every science. So here they begin their paper by saying, Naive realism, representational realism, the idea that the mind just mirrors reality, that's out the window. Quantum mechanics kicks that out. Okay? The very formalism itself, they say, implies a theory of the relationship between object and observer. And when it comes to measurement, as in the case of Schrodinger's cat, okay? They note the essential role played by the consciousness of the observer in the shift from that superposition, cat alive and cat dead, to the definite state, one or other of cat alive or cat dead. But that role, okay, is not the role that's ascribed to it according to the usual story. Okay, they go on to say, looking at the situation from the outside, okay, we should treat the observer you opening the box as just another system to which quantum mechanics applies. Objectively, they say that is for us who consider as the object, the combined system, object, apparatus, observer, you say. The situation seems little changed to what we just met when we, when we were considering only the apparatus and the object, i.e. the observer herself gets included in the superposition. But, they go on to say, Oops. From the inside, the observer herself has a completely different impression. Now, this is the kind of core paragraph. Really. This is the paragraph that led me to think, hang on a minute. There's something going on here that's different from the usual story. For him, it is only the object and the apparatus that belong to the external world, to what he calls objectivity. By contrast, he has with himself relations of a very special character. He possesses a characteristic and quite familiar faculty, which we can call the faculty of introspection. He can keep track from moment to moment of his own state. By virtue of this imminent knowledge, he attributes to himself the right to create his own objectivity, that is, to cut the chain of, statistic of statistical correlations. Now, there's quite a lot going on in that paragraph, but notice first the appeal to imminent knowledge. There is something about us that, as it were, marks us out as <clears throat> different from just another body. Okay? We have this faculty of introspection. We can keep track. We can know what state we are in. And we then, and this is an interesting phrase, we can attribute to ourselves the right to create our own objectivity, to cut the chain of statistical correlation, that is to break free from the superposition. So from, uh, from their perspective, from this perspective of this phenomenological tradition, what we don't have is some consciousness, a, a mind that is outside of the superposition, outside of the box, as it were, and that somehow reaches into the box and causes the superposition to collapse into a definite state. That's the usual story. That's not what London and Bauer are actually saying. We ourselves, if we are observed from outside, we are included in the superposition. But we have this faculty that enables us to separate ourselves from the superposition and say, I am in the state of observing a live cat. Hooray. And they go on to say, accordingly, we will labor, label this creative action okay, as making objective. By it, the observer establishes his own framework of objectivity and acquires a new piece of information about the object in question. This is an, 
a note that London added himself to the text. Okay, now, you know, you might think, oh, hang on a minute. So this all sounds, you know, making objective, this all sounds very subjectivist. Are we sliding down some kind of slippery slope to solipsism? I'll come back to that. But they, they state quite explicitly that the usual story is not what they're claiming. That's not what they're, 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 they're talking about. They go on to say, it is not a mysterious imp interaction between the apparatus and the object that produces the shift during the measurement. It is only the consciousness of an I who can separate himself and by virtue of the of observation set up, or in French constitue, con constitute a new objectivity in attributing to the object a new state, i.e. we attribute to the cat the state alive or sadly dead. So from this phenomenological perspective, that shift from the superposition to a definite state isn't some kind of collapse. It isn't the mind somehow reaching in and causing the, the superposition to collapse into a definite state. Rather, what it is, is a kind of mutual separation of the subject and the object. And these are sometimes referred to as poles in this correlative relationship. Now, this is, this is in a way quite, um, uh, in a way it's quite difficult to conceive of, and this can be seen as a cost of the phenomenological move, because we normally think of a relation as that which holds between two relata. You have two relata, you know, I don't know, myself and my son, and we are related by the father-son relationship. But you have the relata first, you have the persons first, and the relation, as it were, gets established between them. But this, in a way, is turning that on its head. It's almost as if you have the relation and the relata kind of, you know, are, are cons um, conceptually emerge as poles of the relationship. They're not there beforehand. Um, it's perhaps easier to think of this in terms of... Um, uh, you know, uh, judgments, for example, or you know, sort of conscious actions. There is a kind, there is some kind of conscious action, this reflection, this inward reflection that leads to the separation of the subject, the ego, from the object, the system that you're observing, the cat in this case. Whatever you think about that, I hope you will agree that this offers a new perspective on that debate. OK. The observer is included within the quantum description. Consciousness on this view is not some extra or some special entity beyond the physics. Consciousness doesn't affect physical systems in some peculiar way. There's no mysterious interaction between the mind and the world. Rather, there is a separation of both from the superposition. <clears throat> and London, I think, is claiming all of this can be understood from within the phenomenological framework. Indeed, I'm claiming that he is suggesting that quantum mechanics represents a kind of, as it were, a physical exemplification of Husserl's phenomenology. That's what he, they meant at the beginning of their pamphlet about a new view on objectivity, a new way of understanding the relationship between subject and object. I think London saw quantum mechanics on his interpretation as exemplifying Husserlian phenomenology. It's kind of a bold claim. Now, as I said, you might have a worry um, that we've sort of lost objectivity here. It's all uh, very subjective. Um, and London and Bauer are kind of upfront about this. They say our understanding this concept involves a determination of the necessary and sufficient conditions for an object of thought to possess objectivity and to be an object of science. It's all right. Husserl has, they say, Husserl has systematically studied such questions and has thus created a new method of investigation called phenomenology. They actually cite Husserl in their, uh, in their, in their little book. I mean, seriously, I mean, you know, it's, it's, kind of, it's, it's, it's like they left clues, explicit clues, and it's just astonishing that neither Vigna nor Margano, Putnam nor Shimoni, you know, spotted them. 
they go on to say that the classical concept of uh, objectivity is useless, incorrect, it's an obstacle to progress. It's the phenomenological concept which is sufficient for the needs of physics. And Husserl is explicit that the transcendency, i.e. the objectivity that a physical thing has, as determined by physics, is the transcendency that belongs to a be being which becomes constituted in, there's that word again, in French it's constitué, and tied to consciousness. The two cannot be separated. To talk of the state of the cat, the atom, right, is to bring in consciousness. It is uh, a state that only has meaning in relation to the consciousness of the observer. You can't say that the cat has a definite state in and of itself of being alive or dead. It's alive in relation to the state of you, the observer, seeing it or observing it as alive. Now you might worry, okay, yeah, yeah, fine, fine. Whole new way of understanding objectivity, blah, blah, blah. What about intersubjective agreement? What about if I'm watching you observing the cat? How can we be sure that we're gonna you know, both see cat alive? How, how are we gonna be sure that you're not gonna say, I see a live cat and I say, hang on a minute, no, I don't, I see a dead cat. That can't happen, okay? <clears throat> Um, if we take establishing intersubjective agreement as a physical interaction, i.e. I go over to you and say, let's compare notes. What did you see? Quantum mechanics itself guarantees consistency between observers. It guarantees that you and me um, will see the same thing or will report the same thing. So there's no uh, issue about intersubjective agreement. We can we can all agree. Um, and that's, that's interesting because um, that point um, is also made in a recent interpretation of, of uh, quantum mechanics due to Carlo Rovelli. Carlo Rovelli is a physicist, but he's also someone who's very interested in philosophy and the arts. I think he was on Andrew Marr's Start the Week radio show on Radio 4 this week, um, along with Roger Penrose, who just won the Nobel Prize. Um, Ravelli's got a new book of essays out on um, you know, science and art and philosophy and Dante and all things Italian. And he, Ravelli, in his interpretation of quantum mechanics, writes, if I observe an electron at a certain position, I cannot conclude that the electron is there. I can only conclude that the electron as seen by me is there. Quantum events only happen in interactions between systems. <clears throat> and the fact that a quantum event has happened is only true with respect to the systems involved in the interaction. So this resonates, I, I hope you, you will agree, resonates uh, very strongly with the London and Bauer view. You can't conclude that the cat has a definite state, that the electron has a different, definite position. You can only conclude that the electron has a definite position as seen by you. Now what's missing from Ravelli's account is an appropriate framework for me or you, for the observer, for consciousness. Okay, he's just, you know, he sets out a very general uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics in terms of uh, the systems of relations. But I think actually it would benefit from drawing on this resource, recovered from this lost history, um, uh, and sort of, as it were, couching his uh, interpretation within this broader phenomenological framework in which uh, our relationship with the world is explored and articulated in. Uh, uh, a lot of detail and in particular as I keep emphasizing in a way that does not set us or our consciousness outside of the physics or beyond the physics I mean it may be um, that you can articulate different accounts of the relationship between what we call consciousness and our brain states depending on how you know what neurophysiology tells you, you can articulate different accounts within that phenomenological tradition but the whole core of it is 
we should not see our, ourselves as outside of the world in some way. And I, I think that Ravelli's relationalism would be enhanced by that phenomenological perspective. Okay, um, I should wrap up. I don't actually know how long I've been, been talking, but I'll, I'll, I'll start to wrap up. As I said, uh, um, it's not just, as it were, the kind of geeky excitement at discovering that what you had always been taught was wrong and that the history was actually quite different. I do think this exemplifies a more general point or two intertwined general points. One is a point, as I said, that's been made time and again, particularly recently, that quite often history is effaced. We know this happens in the case of women in art, in philosophy, also in science, um, in uh, um, uh, you know, the philosophy of other cultures. That all gets lost from the standard histories we're taught. But the other point I want to make, and this is quite blunt, I'm going to be quite blunt about this. I think recovering that history is not just valuable in itself, it's valuable as a resource that we can then appropriate to help resolve uh, problems that we face in, or, you know, in the, in the, in, that we come across in the pursuit of our own traditions. So thinking of us, you know, I, I imagine that most of us in, the, in philosophy uh, were taught in what's known as the analytic or Anglo-American tradition. And here we come across these problems like the measurement problem in quantum mechanics, drawing on resource from another tradition, the phenomenological tradition that is often dismissed as continental philosophy. We can shed new light on this problem, perhaps see it in a new way. And that's uh, uh, certain philosophical solutions, the role of consciousness in quantum mechanics, certain positions that may appear dead, that may appear to have been you know, criticized and pushed out of the picture, then gain new life by revisiting those circumstances, by drawing on that different philosophical tradition. And I think that benefits both, you know, the, the, the tradition that we're drawing on by showing how it can apply to these problems that had previously thought to be outside of it, and benefits the tradition that we're in by showing that actually it's perhaps rather narrow and that by drawing on these extra resources, we can broaden it and overcome uh, these kinds of obstacles. Okay, I'll stop there and happy to answer any questions at all on this stuff.